Hello everyone and welcome back to PC Retro Programmer. In the past couple of videos we've been trying to come up with a way to do cycle accurate graphics effects with the original IBM CGA card. To do that we need to do cycle accurate register writes to the CRT controller chip on the card, but we found there are various sources of jitter which make this difficult. In the previous video we dealt with interrupts which are interrupting the CPU and we turned those off. And in today's video, we're going to deal with dynamic RAM refresh. This is done by the DMA controller periodically to keep the contents of memory alive. And it interferes with the bus, which the CPU is also using. So we're going to turn that off as well. Now, you might wonder what happens if you turn off DRAM refresh. Of course, the contents of RAM decay, and eventually you'll get parity errors. But it will only happen in RAM uh, that hasn't been accessed for a while. It turns out that accessing RAM automatically refreshes the contents. So because we're going to be running a loop which just uses the same piece of code over and over again, that won't decay and so everything will be fine. Uh, we just won't be able to go back to DOS and expect to be able to continue on as normal because some areas of RAM will have decayed and as soon as we access them we'll get parity errors. So let's take a look at some code for turning off DRAM refresh, and it turns out to be really easy to do. Uh, this is the same code that we saw in the previous episode, and just before our frame loop, I've added a few lines here for turning off DRAM refresh. Now, about the only thing that we need to know in order to turn off DRAM refresh is that on the PC, the DMA controller is triggered by a pulse every 18 pet cycles by channel 1 of the PET, the programmable interval timer. And so it turns out that if we can stop this channel 1 from sending this regular pulse, the DMA controller will never be triggered, and so no DRAM refresh will occur. So to turn this off, uh, it's very straightforward. We just write to the mode command register of the PET, we'll select channel 1, and we're going to put it into mode 1. And this is a hardware triggered one shot. So whatever it does, it's only going to do it once and then just stop. And that's exactly what we want. In addition, we'll set the count to uh, the lowest possible. We'll just set it to one pet cycle. So we can be sure that after one pet cycle, uh, everything will cease and the machine will be quiet. Uh, so let's take a look at the code for doing this. Now this code is in jitter3.asm. There's a link in the description if you're following along at home. And you can see it's a simple matter of writing out to the mode command register of the PET at port 43 hexadecimal. And the value that we'll write has bits set for PET channel 1, uh, the low high byte method of writing the count, and it'll be a binary count. And we'll select mode 1, this hardware trigger one shot. And then the only thing that remains is to write out the count itself. And we do this by writing to port 41 hexadecimal, which is the data port for channel 1. And the low count byte will be a 1, and the high byte will be a 0. So that will give us an overall count of 1. And that's all there is to it. Now DRAM refresh is off. Now this version of the code, jitter3a.asm, is going to check for a key press every frame using int16h. You see it's a very short loop here, it doesn't do very much. And uh, the other version that I'll show you in a moment, jitter3b, is not going to use int16h. It's just going to run the loop a certain number of times before exiting. Uh, but it will try and do really random things in the loop, just to see how well uh, things are going. Uh, now notice that uh, these loops have this halt instruction at the beginning, which we talked about in the previous video. Remember that we have our own timer set up on channel 0 of the pit, which fires off an interrupt at exactly the same point every frame. And this has the effect of waking the CPU up from this halt. Uh, but it turns out there are a few subtleties to do with this. And there's an interesting story to be told here. So after the previous video, I got talking to Ryan Igni. Uh, who did the reverse engineering of the microcode ROM in the 8088 from uh, photographs from Ken Shiroff's blog, uh, who is also reverse engineering the CPU. And I also got some comments on the previous video from Glorious Cow, who is the guy that is responsible for the Marty PC emulator 
that I'm using here. And they both mention that there are some subtleties with this halt and even some things that we don't fully understand and how much you actually expect an emulator like Marty PC to be 100% cycle accurate when there are things that we don't quite understand yet, uh, well, that's up to you. But uh, basically, uh, what they mentioned is that the halt instruction can take an additional cycle depending on what state it was in when the halt instruction was run. So waking up the CPU is not necessarily uh, exactly the same amount of time in cycles uh, every time. Now, I don't think that's going to be a problem here because uh, immediately before the halt instruction is run, we're doing a conditional jump here. And that should, at the very least, clear the prefetch queue, which should put the processor in uh, a known state. So I don't think we're going to run into this issue here, but that could actually be a source of jitter that we might have to look out for. And uh, in addition to this, there are a couple of other things that I probably should have mentioned at the previous video. Uh, you can't wake up from a halt immediately. It does actually take a couple of cycles. And in addition to that, the bus on the 8088 is actually seven cycles, not four, it turns out. The only reason we can actually run instructions every four cycles is because of pipelining in the CPU. So when you're waking up from a halt, you actually incur this full seven cycles, not four, for the first bus access, uh, which is kind of interesting. But at least all of that stuff is constant and is not going to bother us. Now, I'll also show you this version of the code as well. This is jitter3b.asm, and we've actually seen this in the previous episode as well, except that I've now gone ahead and added in exactly the same code for disabling DRAM refresh before the frame loop. But this one also sets up the CGA segment before the frame loop, because in the frame loop, it writes random numbers of bytes into video RAM, the reason it does that is because those will trigger wait states which will delay the CPU in completely random ways. So this is as good as we're going to get as far as randomly messing things up as much as possible. But it really shouldn't matter what is happening in our frame loop. We're hoping that by turning interrupts and DRAM refresh off and using this halt trick that the CPU will be in halt mode when our interrupt for the background color change fires. And so hopefully we'll now get a completely stable background color change with no jitter whatsoever, despite all this other garbage going on. So let's actually run these programs and see what happens uh, here on Marty PC. Uh, so we'll start with jitter3a, and this is the one that checks for a key press every frame. And as you can see, we don't get a stable background color change. Uh, there's still a lot of jitter there, quite a few cycles. Uh, when I press a key, it goes back to DOS, and I don't get uh, any parity errors. So what's going on here? Well, first of all, you don't always get parity errors when you go back to DOS. And the reason is that the portions of the DOS code that are actually running might be using the same row addresses as the code that you are running. And remember that just running code keeps the memory alive. So we may have actually been keeping some of DOS alive as well. Uh, one way to find out is usually to run the DIR instruction. This will often give you parity errors because other portions of the DOS code are run. Now that doesn't happen here in Marty PC, but uh, here you come to an interesting question. To what extent are you going to model a PC accurately? Are you going to worry about even all the glitches that no one is really interested in? And I'm not even sure that I would bother modeling parity errors occurring due to the decay of memory contents. It seems like a very expensive thing to model. And are you going to model heating up of chips that cause glitches? And we know this happens with the CRT controller, for example. Uh, and they're just going to result in uh, awful glitches that occur as code is running that no one wants to see. Are you going to model uh, all of the really obscure corners of the CPU, which aren't even fully understood yet, which absolutely no one in their right mind is taking advantage of, 
but which if you do model accurately are going to slow down the emulator for absolutely everybody? Well the answer is no. In practice you don't always model everything perfectly uh, if you can get away with it. Typically if a significant piece of code emerges that takes advantage of some trick then you model it. So we might expect to see some differences here and I'll also run uh, Jitter 3B and see what happens here. And actually things are much better, but there does look like there's still one cycle uh, of Jitter going on there. And maybe this is the halt instruction cycle smuggling, as Regan Igni calls it. Uh, this additional one cycle of indeterminacy uh, that depends on the state of the halt instruction when it was run. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that's what's going on here, but the only way we're going to find out is to run this code on a real PC and see what actually happens. After all, that's what matters in the end. And whether the emulator writers want to emulate all of this down to the cycle exactly is probably going to depend on whether a significant demo appears that uses any of these tricks. So let's see what happens on a real PC. Now I apologise for the audio and video quality here, but this is one reason why you do want to use an emulator and why almost everyone does if they're filming for YouTube. But uh, this is a real IBM XT, uh, which should run exactly the same as a PC. Uh, let's see what happens when we run Jitter 3A. Uh, it's just loading off floppy, so it takes a couple of seconds there, but you can see that the result is exactly the same as in Marty PC. And Currently, uh, this is a mystery. Uh, I've talked to Rian Igni about this, and we simply don't know at this point what's going on here. Uh, let me also press a key to go back to DOS and see what happens there. Uh, I just get a blank screen, which is also a little bit strange. Uh, I would have expected to get a parity error, and I've run this a few times, and I don't get that. Uh, a parity error should show up uh, regardless of what video mode you're in. Uh, but presumably uh, something else has gone wrong here uh, to do with the degradation of uh, the contents of RAM. So let me restart the PC and we'll see what Jitter 3B does. Now remember Jitter 3B is the one that messes things up maximally while the frame is running then puts the CPU into halt. Uh, so let's see if we fare any better with this code. Uh, again, it takes a couple of seconds to load from floppy, and look at that. So we don't see exactly the same behavior as in Marty PC here. This is rock solid, uh, despite the fact that, as you can see, we're doing all sorts of writes to video RAM completely randomly. So everything is working exactly the way we expect in this version of the code, but not in the version that calls in 16H. And uh, yeah, this is going to be a little bit of uh, a mystery to try and solve. And I'm going to try and get to the bottom of that in the next video. But for now at least, we have a version of the code that will do what we want. And we can do some further experiments now that we know how to get rid of Jitter completely. Uh, so this is Jitter3b.ism.